Good morning. Thanks for joining us for our webinar focused on reducing corn production cost in 2016. Um, I'm Jim Mintert, director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, and joining me today on our webinar is Dr. Bob Nielsen, who is a professor of agronomy and Purdue Extension Specialist for corn production. Also, Jim Camberato, uh, who's also a professor of agronomy and a soil fertility specialist at, with Purdue Extension. And Dr. Michael Langemeyer, who is our associate director for the Center for Commercial Agriculture. And our focus today is really going to be on uh, how we can reduce production costs in 2016 and actually to some extent looking ahead to 2017. Uh, in some cases, some of the decisions have, have already been made for 2016, but certainly as you think about modifying your production practices in response to this relatively low margin op uh, condition that we're experiencing in the Corn Belt, um, we thought it'd be helpful to review some of the recommendations that our specialists here at Purdue are making based on the research they've been conducting for many years. So with that, I thought it'd be useful uh, to uh, start off, I guess one thing I wanted to mention is uh, if you have questions during the course of the webinar, uh, you're welcome to email those to me at my email address here at Purdue, and I'll try and check those during the webinar. If we don't have a chance to get to them during the webinar, we'll try and respond uh, later today. So my email at Purdue is just jmintert at purdue.edu and we will be checking that periodically during the course of the webinar. So to kind of set the stage, I think, and, and think about what's taken place here, uh, we've done some previous webinars that focused on uh, production cost uh, with an emphasis on land cost, in particular cash rent uh, was the focus of our most recent webinar back in mid-December. And if you haven't had a chance to watch that, we'd encourage you to go back into our archived webinars page and, and talk about that a little bit. But as you can see from the, the chart on the screen, we've identified the, the largest buckets of, of cost in corn production. And of course, land is a big one, but we're gonna focus on a couple of the other big ones, and that would be fertilizer and seed, because uh, combined, uh, those two are about the same size as the land charge on many Indiana uh, and Corn Belt operations. So, and there are some opportunities, we think, to perhaps reduce production cost uh, by using the best technology that we've got out there. And so that's really the focus of today's webinar is thinking about the best science, the best technology, and an attempt to reduce our production cost per bushel. And I guess I want to make that point clear. When we talk about reducing production cost, we want to focus on reducing cost per bushel of corn grown, not necessarily focusing on reducing cost per acre. It's, it, the important variable is reducing our cost per bushel. And, with that thought in mind, Michael, you might want to walk through some of the cost uh, changes that we've observed over the last year. Yeah, one of the very positive things that's happened recently, uh, particularly in the last two or three months, is, is the large drop in fertilizer prices. And this chart clearly illustrates this. Looking at rotation corn and average productivity soil, uh, we're looking at a per bushel cost for fertilizer of 89 cents in the 2015 budget, down to 70 cents in the 2016. Uh, on a per acre basis, that'd be about $30. The reason I mentioned the per acre is it's more than just fertilizer costs have came down recently. Uh, the drop in dryer and machinery fuel has also been positive. And so if you look at total variable costs as a group, uh, which include fertilizer, seed, chemicals, fuel, repairs, uh, insurance, and interest, we've actually dropped uh, per bushel costs from 270 to 242, or about $50 per acre. Uh, so some pretty large drops uh, from, from 2000, uh, in 2016 compared to 2015. On a, uh, on a total cost basis, which, which would include cash rent, operator labor, and machinery ownership costs, uh, break-even price on average productivity uh, ground in our, in our budgets has dropped from 498 or right at $5 uh, to closer to 450 So that's very positive. Obviously, 450 is still a fairly high break-even. That's why we're doing this webinar. Is there other things that we can look at uh, from a, a seeding rate, uh, nitrogen uh, application practice uh, that would help reduce our costs even more than what I'm illustrating right, right in right in this chart. And Michael, as you were talking, I was thinking about some of our previous webinars, especially some of the ones we, we did last winter, and that 10% reduction in variable costs that you're showing is, is probably on the high end of what we thought might happen over this time frame. But that's been helped a lot by this drop in oil prices and energy prices in general, which in turn has contributed yes. to this big reduction in fertilizer prices. Yeah especially since about the 1st of November, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen that drop dramatically these last couple yeah, of months. Yeah, a lot of the percentage <laughs> drop, particularly in fertilizers, came from as, 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 as uh, in the last two or three months. Probably 
probably a 12 to 15 percent of the drop in some of the fertilizer. If you look at nitrogen and potash in particular, uh, it's, it's just in the last two or three months. And so that's extremely positive uh, as you're indicating, Jim. And, and there's, there's been some uh, articles in the press where it, there's a need to drop $100 per acre of production cost. Well, we, we're looking at $50 right here, and so that's very that's that's getting us closer to break even. We still have a ways to go. Right. Uh, that's why we're going to continue to do these these webinars on cost cutting, uh, looking at your cost of production because we still have a ways to go. Uh, but but it certainly helped. Let's see if we can find a piece of that $50 that we're talking about there. So with that, let's talk a little bit about uh, fertilizer in general and, and specifically uh, phosphorus, Jim. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, both phosphorus and potassium. And this chart that I'm showing here really pertains to both of those nutrients. Uh, both are based on soil testing, taking good soil samples, and then using the analysis to determine uh, whether you'll get a profitable response in this year or, or, uh, or not. So uh, uh, Purdue and other land-grant universities have in the past used a pretty conservative approach to making uh, phosphorus and potassium recommendations, and it's called the build-up maintenance uh, approach, and it uh, was developed when a lot of people owned the land they farmed, and it had a more of a long-term perspective on profits than a, a single-year perspective. So uh, here on this chart, if, if you look to the right size side, and I put some numbers on the chart pertaining to just the phosphorus to make it a little easier to illustrate, but uh, on the drawdown side uh, where we have 30 parts per million as the maintenance limit and 40 parts per million as high, um, the recommendation there in the, the traditional recommendation is to just have soil test levels fall gradually into the maintenance range. And that maintenance range is kind of our target for where we'll keep the soil uh, test levels. Uh, this year with prices of corn uh, low and prices of fertil fertilizer relatively high, uh, there's absolutely no opportunity for a profit in that area to fertilizer applications. And in fact, we would suggest that uh, no one maintain their soil at those levels. So really there's no need to apply fertilizer at those, uh, at those levels above 30 parts per million for phosphorus. Uh, potassium would have different numbers and they're dependent on the cation exchange capacity of the soil. So uh, you would want to consult our publications on P and K fertilization to see what those uh, numbers would be for those levels. In the maintenance range, uh, typically the recommendation is to replace crop removal, but there's very little probability of a response to the fertilizer applied in that year. And so again, in a year where funds are tight, uh, you're not expected to make a profit by putting phosphorus or potassium out when you have soil test levels in the maintenance range. So let me interrupt you, Jim. Are you telling us that within the maintenance range that we shouldn't expect a yield response to applied phosphorus right. or potassium? Right, no yield response, right. thus no profit in this year. And the, that philosophy was put in place to give uh, farmers the flexibility to skip years when corn prices were low or fertilizer prices were high or the weather was such that they couldn't get on the fields to make those applications. And so really this is the time to take advantage of those and you know adequate levels of nutrients in the soil um, because that's where the, what the recommendation was designed for. But then the next question someone's going to ask is, but how fast are these soil test levels going yeah. to drop? And, and is that, am I at risk by not putting on for a year or so? Yeah, so uh, for example, with phosphorus, the maintenance range is 15 parts per million wide or 30 pounds per acre, depending on how your soil test is reported. Mm -hmm. uh, the estimate is to, to change soil test 15 parts per million you have to remove 300 pounds of P2O5 per acre. So how much does a crop remove? Uh, well, a corn crop removes uh, about 75 bushels, a 200 bushel corn crop. So there's many 75 years. 75 pounds. 75 pounds yeah. of P2O5. So there's, whatever that is, <laughs> <laughs> several years of crop removal to move out of that maintenance range. Okay. 
So this could be a one-year thing, it could be a two-year thing, but certainly if you have 50 parts per million, it's many years of withdrawal without having to put on P205 to maximize profit. So the really critical spot for making recommendations is shown when you're below the critical levels. And that's where you have a probability of getting a yield increase and a profitable yield increase. And the standard recommendation is actually uh, satisfies crop removal and it adds extra P and K to build the soil back up to the maintenance range. And uh, again, in a tight year with funds uh, limiting, uh, that recommendation is going to be too high to maximize profit. So if one's at, at the low end uh, of the critical, uh, of the of low end of the low category, uh, probably about 100 pounds of either P or K, depending on which is low, would be needed to uh, maximize profit. And when you approach the critical level, the necessary amount to maximize profit is more in the range of about 50 pounds of nutrient per acre. But those rates would not also build up the soil. It would simply maximize the yield response and therefore profit, but you sort of acknowledge or accept the fact you're not going to be building soils? Well, actually, yeah. Soil tests would be decreasing okay. somewhat because you wouldn't even be replacing uh, crop removal. Okay. So you would anticipate having to apply that fertilizer in later years uh, at some point in time. And so you'd have to weigh the immediate needs for saving money versus mm -hmm. uh, future, uh, future profits and future needs. The lower you get in that category, the, you're, you're encountering a lot more risk if you can't get out and apply the fertilizer at, to those soils. So Jim, one question I, I receive sometimes from people is a discussion point with respect to, does it make a difference with respect to how you apply the fertilizer? And what I'm really thinking about is broadcast uh, versus a, a planter type uh, banded application? Yeah. Most of the research has shown that at moderate to moderately low soil test levels, there's no advantage to either banding or broadcast. They're equally effective. Uh, at low, the lowest of soil test levels, they've actually found a combination of the two is better than either one alone. Okay. So, um, uh, oftentimes it would be more efficient with smaller amounts of fertilizer, say the 50 pound rate, to apply it just with the planter. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Because uh, particularly with phosphorus, that's pretty easy. So in terms of management recommendations, I think we've identified a place where from a cash flow standpoint, people, probably a lot of people in the Corn Belt, uh, looking carefully at their soil test results, might identify a situation where they can go with some rates in 2016 on P and K that are probably somewhat lower than what they've used in recent years. But the key here is have a soil test, a recent soil test, and use that as your guideline. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And allocate the P and K to the very lowest areas of the farm. Yeah, and so really it is a, a function of, of also allocating it to the, to the areas of the farm that need it the most and actually thinking about how to spend your dollars wisely. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if, if you're lower on one of those nutrients, let's say, for example, P, Perhaps that's a, an opportunity to earn a higher return by putting more dollars towards P, and maybe if, you're, if your potash tests are somewhat higher, uh, maybe de-emphasize that. So yeah. really optimizing uh, your application to really improve profitability. This is a classic case where uh, you're looking at benefits and costs. I mean, you know, you're going to, in, the, in the, low, the very low uh, end of this range, in the low category there, you're going to get some yield response, and so that's a benefit. Uh, and and that, I think that's with every input we need to think about that. What's the benefit this year, but also long term, of doing this practice? And what's the cost? And the benefits better outweigh the cost, or, or we shouldn't be doing it. That's right. Let's switch our attention and talk a little bit about nitrogen rates, Jim. Okay. So nitrogen is uh, um, more often needed than phosphorus and potassium. There is no good soil test, in, at least in the eastern Corn Belt, for determining nitrogen availability and, and most fields throughout the Corn Belt require nitrogen to make optimum profits. Um, here in, in the Eastern Corn Belt, uh, uh, our in-loss risks are, are higher than say the Northern Corn Belt or Western Corn Belt because we get a, a lot of rainfall in, in the winter and early spring. And so we can lose some of the nitrogen that we apply <coughs> 
if we apply it in the fall or early spring, um, even if it's applied as anhydrous. So one of the factors that, or, or practices that could be improved to take better advantage of the nitrogens that supplied is to put the nitrogen on closer to planting time or actually in season. And in here, uh, we estimate on average, say a fall application would lose maybe 15% of the nitrogen. Early spring, maybe 10%. So opportunity to either use less nitrogen or maybe make higher yields with the same amount of nitrogen by moving that nitrogen into the spring. And that's your kind of your average estimate, but in a given year, that could vary quite a bit. So right. based on your experience, if we happen to have adverse weather conditions, what are some of the larger end losses you've seen? Now, I, I think Bob and I, we've done some research with uh, manure applied in August, and, and we estimated that all of it was lost, so 250 pounds of N. But I, and uh, I'd say with fall anhydrous, you know, you could ha easily have a year where you lost 50% of it. Um, and, and a bad year would be kind of a warm fall, and then, uh, you know, a wet winter, wet spring. The spring is more important than the fall. I mean, the, the winter on the rainfall bit. But the warm fall just sets the nitrogen up to be lost. And if we look at our fall and win early winter this year, it's been pretty mild. And temperatures have been in the mid to high 40s for a long time. So it could be, we could be set up to lose a lot of nitrogen in the spring if we have a wet spring. And Jim, this is a classical case of risk management, right? Because we're, we're not saying this, these end losses occur all the time with fall applied or early spring, but certainly the risks are higher. And so it seems to me when times are, are tough economically that, that you know, we, we need to be maybe lowering the risks on, on some of the decisions we make to try and maximize the, the result we're going to get at the ends. And I guess this ties into some of the research you've been doing as well, because I know one of the concerns a lot of farmers have, and I remember this from my experience on the farm, with respect to side dressing nitrogen, the number one concern is, mm -hmm. can I get it on in a timely fashion? And that's been the reason a lot of farmers in the past have emphasized the early spring applications and to some extent the fall applications. But you both have been doing some research on that in recent mm -hmm. years, and you might elaborate on that a little bit. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we, we've been looking at late applications uh, both as rescue and uh, potentially to increase the use of crop sensors and, and, and things like that. And uh, we've been surprised uh, at how much potential the corn crop has to take up nitrogen late in the year and respond by increasing yield if the crop is healthy and if you have a favorable grain fill period. And so uh, I think you've probably been surprised by the 110 bushel yield increases that we've gotten with as late as V15 applications on uh, corn that eventually makes 225 bushels. And so very late applications, of the crop's healthy. If the weather is good during grain fill, good moisture, then it can uh, make up a lot of ground. Uh, we don't... Um, uh, suggest that people do that on purpose though, but in, in rescue situations, which we had a lot of last year, uh, we don't think people should give up on the crop because if it's healthy, there's a lot of potential to make up lost ground with fairly late applications. Um, however, with respect to, say, fall nitrogen, um, the University of Missouri has done a, a, some research and they've shown the risk of nitrogen loss or yield loss from fall and uh, fall nitrogen is about equal to the risk of yield loss from nitrogen applied just before tasseling. So, um, uh, if if you were delayed late into the growing season, it would you would be no better, no worse off than if you had put on fall anhydrous. So I think the 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 fear is is greater for the in season applications, but they really should be greater for the fall applications because th those losses are going to be more frequent and of greater magnitude than lost yield from a too late application. I think that's the take home message, and especially if you already put on fall nitrogen in, in the fall of 15 for the 2016 crop, obviously it's too late, but looking ahead in terms of preparations for the 2017 crop, 
you both would recommend staying away from the fall applied nitrogen, right? Yeah, particularly mm -hmm. in the eastern <laughs> Corn Belt. Now, northern and western Corn Belt, where the winters, end loss tends to be less frequent um, because of the winters and the colder temperatures. But so to contrast that, we talked a little bit about efficiency with respect to P and K, and your comment was that there wasn't a big difference between um, the banding applications. Here, this is a situation where the, the technology, the approach you use to putting on nitrogen can have a significant impact, right? So that's something yes. to really pay attention to mm -hmm. if you're trying to reduce your, your per, per bushel production costs. So, yeah. so um, this illustrates a typical response to nitrogen. And I think uh, on average in Indiana, in our research, uh, nitrogen f uh, application doubles yield. So pretty important and in some cases it increases yield fivefold. And, and some to clarify, of when he says double yield, uh, if you put nothing on, mm -hmm. yeah. you may get about half a crop, at least in this part of the Corn Belt. And so in that, from that perspective, it can double yields. And, and this yield response curve you know, shows how, uh, how sharp that yield response is on the low end, where you're putting on the first 50 or 100 pounds of nitrogen, getting a very strong yield response. It's almost linear. And then, uh, as in, and maybe the other thing to point out, Jim, is that it's a, it is a curved response. It's not a straight line response. And so at some point, that yield response begins to taper. And as uh, the fertilizer rate approaches the optimum, the yield response basically flattens out. And so from an economic perspective, uh, this kind of a yield response curve has big ramifications on, on the economic nitrogen rates because those last few pounds of, or I'm sorry, last few bushels of corn that you get out of the last few pounds of nitrogen are extremely expensive uh, bushels. And so that's what's, you know, I think, in, well, for the past five or so years, yeah. Jim and I have been talking also about economic end rates as we talk about this and, and I guess less so on agronomic end rates. Yeah, so <laughs> shooting for maximum yield, you're losing money right. on the nitrogen, and then you have to handle and dry right. uh, more grain that actually costs you more to produce than it's worth. So it's a classic economics <laughs> problem. We like to, in economics terms, we like to talk about uh, equating marginal cost, the, the right. additional cost of putting on that. Uh, and that's been a painful <laughs> lesson for us agronomists. <laughs> <laughs> So we like to equate marginal cost and marginal return, and that's really what we're talking about here. So, yep. all right, um, talk a little bit more about end rates. Yeah, so uh, our recommendations are based on oh, a couple hundred trials that we've done in the last uh, t 10 years. And uh, I want to point out that they're not, you know, in any one year in time, they're probably not the most profitable rate, but over time they are. It's very hard to predict the optimum rate every year, especially early in the growing season um, when uh, so little of the, the, the crop is, is you know, very young. <laughs> and so on, on a particular field, we found uh, the optimum rate can vary plus or minus 30 to 40 pounds of N per acre. Um, and that's because of the differences in nitrogen loss year to year. And so that impacts the, the optimum end rates. Yeah. <coughs> um, and the recommendations I'm going to show are for corn after soybean, which typically requires 40 to 50 pounds of N per acre less than corn after corn. So if you're growing corn after corn, uh, you can take these recommendations and add 40 or so pounds per acre to get a corn after corn recommendation. And then because we're using economics and the price of corn and fertilizer changes every year, uh, the uh, the recommend, and recommended end rate changes from year to year. Mm -hmm. We economists love it when the agronomists start talking. <laughs> about it, so. I just want to ask a question, Jim, is, is, and Jim and Bob, is, is the response curve for corn after corn look a little different than corn after soybeans, or not really? Well, it isn't that different, it's just that it peaks at a higher value. Yeah, the, the, sh it, it, yeah, right. the optimum's going right. to be in a different yeah. place, but the, the right. shape is similar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's still a curved response, okay. yes. Yeah. So here <laughs> I've just illustrated our recommendations for economic optimum end rates for the various areas around the state. And I, I used $4 corn and... You, you're really optimistic <laughs> there, Jerry. And you're a corn, you're a corn bull. Yeah. <laughs> Just mark my words, it'll be at $4. <laughs>
Um, <coughs> and you'll note uh, how it varies substantially from region to region. So out east in central Indiana, our soils are very poorly drained. We have more end loss. The plants are less efficient. We have substantially higher uh, end recommendations than we do in the, in the, w in the western and southern uh, areas of the state. Um, now, if you're interested in other uh, corn prices and fertilizer prices, uh, we have a publication online that's available that shows the different end costs and, and different grain prices, and you can l look up for your particular region the, the recommendation for those uh, uh, prices. Uh, and it can vary substantially. You see with the high corn and, and low nitrogen in the upper right of that chart, the recommendation be about 175 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, and in the lower left uh, of the, the chart with low grain and high end prices, it would only be about 130 pounds of N per acre. So depending on the price ratio, you come further and further down that response curve to find the economic optimum. And a chart like that is invaluable in today's environment because both corn price and nitrogen price are changing pretty rapidly. And so it's really important to look at the chart for your part of the state of Indiana, mm -hmm. or if you're outside of Indiana, maybe consult with your, in your own land-grant university with respect to their recommendations. We hope the ranges that we have in these tables are s adequate for yeah. the very building we'll see in the next 12 months. but. Uh, but it is a bit of a challenge uh, in, over time of, of keeping these things up to date. And, um, and again, uh, you know, what we're showing on this uh, chart that's on the screen is simply for West Central and Southwest Indiana. And, and we have tables for other areas of the state in the publication that we'll see here coming up uh, on, the, on this slide here. So uh, this is available on the web. It's, a, it's available at that lengthy web address there at the bottom. Um, if you go to my Chat and Chew Cafe website um, uh, here at Purdue, you can also find links to this and other publications there. And, and I, think, I think you and Michael will be putting this probably up on your website soon too. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have it on the Center for Commercial Ag right. website. We'll link back to your, your uh, site, Bob, right. so we'll try and make that a little easier to find. But mm -hmm. uh, actually, I think this is true. I think if you go into Google and type uh, uh, nitrogen management recommendations Purdue, I think it'll pop probably. up number one on that's, your on your yeah. search results. So that's, that's another true. way to find it as well. And, mm -hmm. and Jim, we didn't show the agronomic rates. They're in this mm -hmm. publication here, but we're talking $10 per acre for West Central Indiana. That's kind of a minimum figure, but the, the difference between the, the rates that we showed here and the, and the, and the yield maximizing rates, it's mm. at least $10 an acre. Yeah, so we've really identified, uh, we talked at the outset about right. trying to find that extra $50 per acre. Uh, we haven't identified all of it. But so are we there yet? We, we've made some headway here. Closer. We have made right. some headway. Well, I think there are some opportunities, f depending on what your, your recent practices have been. So, Well, let's see if we can save some more of them. All right, let's, okay. let's, let's talk about seed, Bob. So th there's a couple of issues with seed. One is hybrids themselves and your choice of hybrids, and one is about seeding rate. Uh, but to begin with, with hybrid characteristics, uh, certainly I've had more questions this, this past fall and winter from growers about whether or not they need transgenics or traded corn because uh, there's oh, as much as $100 per bag uh, difference on fully traded corns versus uh, non-traded or non-GMO, if you will. And so clearly as folks are looking at ways to save seed costs and they look at a potential $100 savings per bag. and let's say at 34,000 seeds per acre, that's roughly $43 difference right there. So that's, that's almost the $50 you were talking about. And certainly this is an opportunity to save a lot of money on seed costs, but it needs to be done smartly because you know, the traded uh, hybrids have, we have today are mostly either protecting against uh, some of the insect pests that we worry about or it's allowing us to use some herbicides like glyphosate or glufosinate uh, without injury to the crops. And so it's really insect control and weed control. And so uh, you need to look at, you need to think about this really smartly. And, and if, for example, you're in say southern Indiana where rotation corn is still a fairly effective way to control against corn rootworm, well then it is true that you may not need the rootworm trait in that bag of seed corn. And so maybe you can go with only an above ground trait coupled with a roundup and you'd save a little bit of money there. Uh, 
Um, if you feel that you can control corn borer or some of the other moths fine with other insecticides or perhaps you feel they're not a problem in your, in your operation, well then maybe you don't need that particular kind of BT trait either. So there are opportunities to, to go to non-GMO hybrids and save a lot of money, but there needs to be a lot of good thought put into that. So, uh, so that's, that's the key thing I'd say on transgenic. The, the next uh, uh, probably thing that I would focus on uh, as importantly is the hybrid selection process itself. And just remind folks that uh, it's not just about yield potential. And certainly, we, we, I mean, we are after high yield, all right? But it's not just about high yield. It's also about the ability of hybrids to yield well consistently, no matter what kind of growing conditions we face. And the importance of that is that we're in a time period now of extreme climatic variability. And I think most meteorologists and climatologists in the country would agree that we're in this time period now in the past 20 or 30 years where the climatic variability is simply getting higher. And that means we never could predict next year, right? In terms of weather, mm -hmm. it's becoming even more difficult to predict because of the extreme weather events we get. And so we just don't know what kind of extreme weather we're going to face this next growing season. And therefore, we need to try to find hybrids that have a wide array of tolerance to stress, whether it's hot or cold or wet or dry. And if we can find those hybrids, that is going to allow us to perhaps increase yield itself, but maybe more importantly, try to minimize the year-to-year -year swings in yield because the year where you lose, say, 20, 30 bushels because of the weather, well, I suspect we all put the same amount of money into that crop, which means, you know, we've spent a lot of money to get those fewer number of bushels. And so if we can avoid those big swings and produce more yield for the same money, then certainly that's going to have a big impact on that contribution margin. So, Bob, mm -hmm. when you look at uh, stress uh, and trying to evaluate hybrids, I think based on some previous conversations, mm -hmm. one of the things you suggested to me was that you like to look at hybrids uh, not just from your own geographic region, right. but you like to move a little bit beyond right, that. Right. You might elaborate on that a little and bit and more. I, and I think the next slide may, may have some of those bullet points, but certainly it's important to look at hybrid performance in a wide number of variety trials. Um, and, as you say, not restricted geographically too much. And we sometimes get a little too focused on staying in our little niche of the state and not going out beyond that. It's okay to look at variety trials from neighboring states, especially at the same latitude. And because what we're doing with variety trials is we're trying to uh, actually get a, a wide range of growing conditions expressed by the variety trials. So if I can look, say, let's say I'm here in West Central Indiana, so I'm looking at the Purdue Variety Trials, I'm looking at the Eastern Illinois uh, Variety Trials from the University of Illinois, I'm looking at all the seed company trials I can find in, in this latitude of the state, um, and I'm looking for hybrids that sort of always are in that upper 10%. Maybe they don't win many trials outright, but they're always sort of hanging up there in that upper 10%. If I can find those kinds of hybrids, that tells me that they are probably pretty stress tolerant and they're going to do a lot better job for me not knowing what next year is going to be. They're going to do a lot better job of performing consistently. And, and that, that is just key. As, as we look down the road, you know, the next five or ten years with the, the weather extremes that we've been facing, it's absolutely crucial to find these hybrids that do pretty darn good most of the time. So stated another way, if in an ideal world, what you'd like to have are a large number of observations on an individual hybrid in your local area right. to, to get data right. and your soil types uh, right. across a wide variety of weather conditions. Right. We're not able to do that because the technology changes too fast. That's right. But by looking at a broader geographic region, it's a way of effectively getting more observations and, right. and dealing with the risk issue if that you mentioned. If we ran our own variety trial for 20 years, we'd get 20 different weather patterns. Well, we can't afford to do that, as you say. So let's get 20 variety trials scattered over a broad enough region that maybe they give us something close to the same range of weather conditions. Yeah, and so that's the underlying thought process mm -hmm. there, which, which I find very interesting and very, very helpful. Well, so, before, go ahead. Before we go on, how would you use, say, the the company ratings for disease tolerance and drought tolerance and perhaps uh, insect tolerance to make a judgment after you identified the top 10 percent? What I would do first is to look for performance in variety trials and find that group of hybrids that sort of float near the top. 
And then sort of my final cut would be then to look at that group of hybrids and make sure that they have uh, genetic resistance to the diseases important in my area. And of course, for us in Indiana, we're talking about gray leaf spot, northern corn leaf blight in particular, uh, some of the ear rots, um, maybe glosses wilt, depending on where you are in the state. Um, and the same would be true for any other characteristic, uh, early season vigor, drought tolerance, those kinds of things. I would, I would make those kind of judgments after I'd already found hybrids that yielded pretty darn good most of the time. And then I would finish it by making sure it had some of these other characteristics that also confer some amount of stress tolerance. But Jim, you bring up a very important point uh, there because if you can eliminate a fungicide application by looking at those, mm -hmm. looking, looking at that information, that's a lot of money. Oh, that's uh, an excellent point because, yeah. uh, you know, as, as we were talking earlier, yeah. Michael, that uh, Purdue budgets, we don't normally yeah. put in uh, foliar fungicide as part of our budgets, but that's another $25, $30 yeah. somewhere in that ballpark. If we can avoid that cost by doing a better job yeah. of selecting hybrids with excellent disease resistance, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. that's a cheap way to get that, that disease resistance and maybe avoid that extra yeah. you know, uh, foliar fungicide cost. So. And one of, the, one of the points I wanted to, wanted to make, we're gonna talk about crop insurance in a later webinar, but crop insurance does not, does not have as good a revenue guarantee or as much protection uh, as, and, I, I, with respect to downside risk as it mm. had two, three years ago. And so what Bob is talking about here uh, related to stress tolerance when you're picking hybrids is extremely important. Anything we can do to prevent that terrible year from happening uh, is extremely important because our cash flow is already tight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we lose if we lose a lot of money, uh, two hundred dollars extra, uh, uh, you know, go to a kind of extreme case, then we're going to be looking at some financial difficulty. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, another another risk management tool in our in our toolkit, right. effectively. Right. Okay. So the so the second part of, of seed cost is is, in, is as you know we all know so the seeding rate we actually use and. Jim and I have been doing uh, quite a few field scale trials looking at yield response to population in Indiana now the last couple of years too. And, and I'll, I'll just preface this by saying that you know, this chart and what I'm going to say is primarily Indiana focused and certainly I, I wouldn't necessarily guarantee that, that what we've seen in Indiana will be appropriate for the Western Corn Belt or the Northern Corn Belt. But with that said, uh, this yield response curve now that's on the screen is, uh, the average yield response on about 50 or 60 of our trials around the state. And these are the trials that represent what I'd consider to be the, a normal range of growing conditions. And so, uh, and so technically, the agronomic optimum population amongst those set of trials is about 32,000 plants per acre final harvest stand, or a seeding rate of roughly 34,000. But what I've highlighted on this graph are, are two uh, things. The blue box is, represents the range on that yield response curve uh, that varies only plus or minus one bushel. And that ranges from about 29,000 final to about 35,000 final. And so what it means is anywhere in that range, you're basically at optimal yield. You're only varying plus or minus one bushel. It's a very flat response curve. It's not that different actually from the flat part of the nitrogen curve. So that means, again, that last bushel of grain you got from that last dab of seed is awfully expensive. And that means the economic uh, uh, seeding rates, the economic populations uh, are essentially several thousand less than these agronomic numbers that we have up here. And, now that's a little hard for a lot of people to get their hands around where they've been used to, to maybe aiming for the mid 30s or, or even if they're aiming for the low 30s and what we're saying is frankly if you aim for the high 20s final that's probably the economic sweet spot uh, at least for corn in Indiana. So, um, so it's been a, an interesting uh, set of field trials that we've done and these have been all over the state. Uh, and, and I'll take this opportunity as I see the Indiana Corn Marketing Council logo on the bottom of that screen, but, but our corn checkoff dollars have helped support not only this research, but the work that Jim and I are doing on nitrogen. And it certainly provided some, some really good funding to support these very applied field scale kind of trials that we do around the state. And, and so these have been truly statewide from basically the northern border to the Ohio River from east to west on all sorts of, of yield levels, all sorts of soil conditions. And so we think it's a pretty good database. And, uh, and we have more of this. I think maybe the next slide is, uh, shows our, uh, well, I guess it isn't. It just summarizes what I said. But uh, 
So again, agronomically, the sweet spots are low 30s for most of the state on challenging, especially drought prone soils, maybe mid 20s for an agronomic optimum. But again, the economic optimums are several thousand less than those. And, and, and I think that's something for people to keep in mind. And, and we do summarize this in a similar publication uh, that uh, is, I think is on the next slide there, Jim, um, and which is also f uh, found uh, online. You can probably Google that also and Google po plant population Purdue and probably find it. You can go to my Chat and Chew Cafe website and find it. But this is another uh, summary that Jim and I put out every year and, and we hope in the next uh, 30 days. We'll have them updated again, yeah. Jim, do you think? Um, they won't change a lot. Though. Oh yeah, they won't change uh, much at all, but, uh, but the, the same web address will get to the updated one once it is updated. So, so again, I think there's some tremendous opportunities, uh, uh, both from the hybrid selection perspective to stabilize yield, maybe from the non-GMO perspective to save seed costs on the seed itself, and also to back off on, on seed costs because, you know, if we, let's say we're talking uh, $240 seed corn and we're saying agronomic optimum is 32,000 final, but maybe 29 is the economic, so there's a difference of three, and you're looking at nine or $10 right there uh, with no risk to yield, yeah. basically. Each thousand, each, each 1,000 increment in corn seeds is 375 to $4. Yeah. So yeah, you're looking at yeah. nine to $10 difference there. So just for clarity, Bob, and mm -hmm. I want to back up to uh, maybe one of your previous slides there. Mm -hmm. So for clarity, the numbers you're putting up there are harvest time populations, right? On this graph, that's true, yes. And so one of the things to think about then is think about your mortality, yes. right? Yes. And that probably varies a little bit depending on production practice, It'll correct? It'll vary year to year because of the weather. Uh, what I would encourage everyone to do is to document their final population uh, every year on every field and keep that as part of your running record of information. And what we have found on, on our 80-some trials that we have around the state is, is we're averaging about 95% success. And so we're only losing about 5% of those seed. And, but within our trials, it, it, we're averaging 95% success, but we're ranging as low as 80 and then all the way as high as a perfect or 100% stand. But I, I think most people can simply use somewhere between 90, 95% as a ballpark. I'd prefer if they document their own and keep that record. And, and that way, if, they, if, they are con if they're confident that they are averaging 95% success, well then they can take these population uh, recommendations we give and, and do the math and come up with the seeding rates. But, but if they're averaging 80%, there's a lot of savings in Adjusting the planter. If they're averaging eighty percent, you'd better be finding out why you're averaging eighty percent because there is no reason with today's seed quality, today's planters, uh, there is no reason to be averaging anywhere close to that. And I'd even say if you're averaging ninety percent, you'd better start looking and, and diagnosing why are you only achieving ninety percent success in stand establishment. So, I think ninety-five is a good uh, achievable ballpark uh, to to aim for. And, uh, and so again, uh, there, of course, there'd be a lot of things to look into in terms of diagnosing why you, you've got problems, but, but certainly I think 95% success is an, an achievable target, but if you don't document it and record it, you're just sort of guessing. So again, it's all about documenting. So I guess one thing I was thinking of as you were talking, Bob, was the difference between a, a, either a conventional or maybe a modified conventional mm -hmm. minimum tillage kind of a, a operation versus more of a no-till. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think this is correct, but you'd expect a little more plant mortality in a no-till situation or um, not. Is that I'm correct? I'm not sure if that's necessarily okay. true. Um, the only reason I might is that uh, high residue uh, reduced tillage systems tend to come out of winter and stay cooler longer and they take a little longer to, to dry out. And so the, ch the conditions might be a little more challenging under high residue uh, no-till systems or strip-till systems. Um, but it's not all. It's not all the time, and so um, I. I think it's. Um, you know, it, it's obviously a, a bit of a detective game that you got to play to to try and diagnose why are you not getting this ninety five percent. And so I, I think it just comes down to good agronomic planting practices. Make sure that you're you're doing everything correct. Make sure the planter is adjusted well, especially for the seed size that you're dealing with. So.
row cleaners, uh, and, row cleaners and and your you know and how well you're closing the furrows and 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 to a certain degree whether or not you're using starter fertilizer to maybe help it through some of that early season challenges uh, kind of thing. So, um, but again, it you know what you got at knee high is what you're going to have at harvest basically and and so you're not usually going to start over from scratch and try to get perfect and so that planting operation itself is a pretty critical time to make sure everything is being done correctly. So maybe a better way of putting mm -hmm. it is to say just because you're farming in a no-till or uh, maybe a, a, a strip-till kind of an operation mm -hmm. don't accept that lower oh heavens that no. lower plant population yeah. or that lower survivability ratio yeah pay more attention, there perhaps is maybe a little higher payoff to yes. uh, yeah. very careful I, management. I would still aim for that 95%, okay. you bet. I would not settle for 90% even in a, in a no-till. Be, just because strip. you're that's in right. no-till, because that's, that's right. one of the comments I, I hear a lot. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, so one, one other point that you just uh, raised, and I, I wanted to maybe follow up on that. We didn't talk about, we talked about starter fertilizer, mm -hmm. uh, which to be clear, you're talking about the two by two banding, right? Mm -hmm. What about in furrow applications? That gets a lot of attention, certainly a lot of advertising. Maybe we could comment a little bit about the value or perhaps lack of value uh, to, well, to the in furrow we've applications. At, uh, in the last couple of years, we've had trials looking at in furrow or pop up. Uh, and and to, to be clear, it's been using 1034.0 as the source, so only a nitrogen source and a phosphorus source. And, and in those trials that we've done, we've seen very little um, consistent benefit at all to the, to the pop-ups. What is a little less clear, uh, you know, there's a lot of other products available today for infuro and, and pop-up, including biologicals, uh, plant growth regulators, uh, micronutrients, and we haven't looked at those very much. And so we, we really can't address those to, to speak of, but from something like a 1034.0 as a pop-up, we just haven't seen much benefit at all, have we? No, and um, you know, previous research in ours typically shows the two by two placement to be the most impactful and consistent across years and soil types and situations. And then and maybe that's some basically or heavily because we can put more safely in a two by two, right? More safely, and then if you compare it to say surface dribbles or. Mm -hmm or bands over the top, it just uh, is in the root zone more consistently and available mm -hmm. to the crop early in the season. Mm -hmm. um, generally the in furrow fertilizer, you can only put a little. And there's sometimes, some, we had some impacts on drier grain at bit. harvest, yeah. no increases in yield, and, and just a much more inconsistent. Well, and, and also to be fair, to clarify, even with row starter, uh, there is not a consistent year-to-year uh, -year yield increase. Uh, we've had trials compared compared to broadcast. To no, well, well to compared to no starter. To compared oh. to no starter. So we've had one location in the same field. It's continuous cornfield. It's no-till in southeast Indiana, and the same hybrid both years. One year we saw 10 to 15 bushel yield responses to 25 pounds or 50 pounds of row starter. The second year, this past year, the field looked just as dramatic early in the season. You could see the yellow no starter passes and the nice green uh, row starter passes. No response. And yield. And yield, I'm sorry, and yield. Uh, moisture was still drier. It was one to two points drier in moisture, even though we didn't see the yield response. So again, I bring that up only just to make sure folks understand that um, that the response to row starter itself is not guaranteed. It is sort of a crop insurance kind of input but if you're using something common like 28% solution as your row starter, and, and let's say this is what you're using for your side dress also is 28%, so your cost per, per pound of nitrogen is the same, mm -hmm. you're just sort of splitting up where you put it. And, and it's probably important to remind folks that we consider row starter to be part of the total nitrogen package, mm -hmm. not additions to. So in our case, in that uh, location in southeast Indiana, corn on corn, we know from prior research we need about 250 pounds of fertilizer, or nitrogen. So of that 250, we might put 25 in the row, and then we side dress 225. So we're still maintaining the 250 total pounds. So the year that you don't get a yield response, the crop still uses all 250 pounds. You just don't get a yield response, but your cost per bushel has stayed the same, basically. And, and the 
impacts on uh, grain moisture have been yeah. fairly consistent Much where it's drier. And the years where you do get harvest. a 10 bushel or 15 bushel response, I think I've done my math right here, Michael, but those would be 10 to 15 free bushels, except for the drying costs, that, yeah. right? But, but yeah. producing the 10 or 15 is free yeah. because we didn't, you know, this is not additional nitrogen, so. What a great way to drive down oh, cost per bushel, right? Yeah, great, yeah. yeah. Plus the grain is drier And it is drier, yeah. The whole, the whole, oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. So all you, the grain is drier. Yeah, so the, you'll save a little bit on that every year for, so. So let me follow up though. So for clarity, the research that you've conducted, have you have you looked at the the low salt formulations that get used in in some of the pop up applications? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So your research doesn't address that directly. Yeah. The reason I brought that up is because those are higher cost, typically well, per unit of. Well, of maybe nutrient. address the salt concern yeah. so in, anyway. Well, we've used ten thirty four O because it's common, it's relatively inexpensive, and it's relatively safe. And, and that you can, we, we just use three gallons, but you can put higher rates without uh, a lot of risk and affecting germination and seedling establishment. So there's, there's really a couple issues with these fertilizers. Part of it is the salt effect, and the other part is whether they can generate ammonia, and ammonia is toxic to those young plants. So, um, you know, you can't just focus on the salt aspect. You have to look at the forms. And, and urea uh, would be something you don't really want to put in furrow. And ammonium thiosulfate is another one that's particularly toxic because it generates ammonium and nitrite. So, um, and the 1034O would be considered a low salt mm -hmm. fertilizer. It's just not at a premium price because it's used in other applications. Okay. So I, as I visit with people, I think that's one of the challenges because I've, I've looked at some corn production budgets mm -hmm. where uh, the use of some of those products in furrow, uh, the pop-up applications, have in fact raised uh, production costs oh, yeah. if there's not a yield benefit to using them. Oh, and I, I think that really has to be looked at hard. And, and, because, and again, it's partly because you're not able to put on very much without risk of injuring the seed. And so that it's almost a numbers game that, that you can put on so much more on a two by two placement. And that sort of increases the odds you're gonna get a good yield response simply because you're able to put on more. And then you factor in the risk uh, of, uh, or the potential risk at least of seedling injury or seed injury with the inferral. You know, having said that, I think, I mean, it's sort of obvious why a lot of folks have gone this way because they've wanted to avoid the cost of the, the two by two attachments on the planter. They want to avoid the weight of all those attachments on the planter. They want to avoid all the refilling of, of a two by two uh, strategy versus an inferral. So, you know, and we were talking earlier today about there's always a lot of other reasons why people do what they do. Uh, we're just saying agronomically, you'd be better off with, with a fairly robust rate in a two-by-two two placement if you want to better ensure a yield response than you would in furrow. And so it's sort of a balancing act you know, folks need to do on their own as to you know, can they really go back and justify two-by-two two for all the other reasons we've talked about you know, or not. So it, it, it can be a challenging decision. And alternatively, they could <coughs> dribble to the side of the seed, which on would, the surface, on the yeah. surface, or they could broadcast maybe 50 pounds of nitrogen ahead of planting or just after planting, and sometimes get a starter effect out of those applications. And when you say sometimes, well, not as consistently <laughs> as the two by two. You're not going to give me a percent of the time. <laughs> Eighty percent of the time, I don't know. Um, one other thing, the, the starter and the early nitrogen gives uh, some flexibility in side dressing. So the, the, the crop has some nitrogen and you're going to yeah. supplement it with the side dress. It's not sitting there stagnant and not growing yeah. because it has Versus no Versus the little amount of nitrogen that you can put in furrow mm -hmm. and then yeah. holding you until you side dress. Right. If you can put on 25 or 30 up front, that's going to allow you a little more flexibility. Yeah. yeah, if it starts raining and you got a delay, putting on that nitrogen until later. So, and it's more most important in no-till mm -hmm. and corn after corn, where you have a lot of early season 
nitrogen tie-up and and uh, and it's cooler and wetter and, yeah, and limited rooting much more challenging for for young plant development so they benefit more or at least the they have I think a higher probability of benefiting more from row starter than say conventional tillage it might be warmer and drier and more conducive so all right so I think we've really identified some potential strategies that people can pursue I think uh, from the P and K side Jim you gave us some great information at the outset talking about some situations where we could either if we're in a high test situation we might actually eliminate those applications uh, if we're in that middle zone we might uh, either cut back on them or potentially depending on the situation you might cut eliminate those entirely mm -hmm. at that point and you gave us some great information about how to maximize returns if you're in that low test uh, zone on both mm -hmm. P and K. Mm -hmm. Bob, you gave us some great information on, on nitrogen rates, mm -hmm. uh, how to look at them, um, how to think about using those as you move around the state, particularly based on the trials that we've got. Um, and obviously the publication uh, that you have on your website is immensely helpful looking at mm -hmm. the trade-offs between nitrogen prices and corn prices so we can really optimize those as, as both of those continue to change as mm -hmm. we move into the 2016 season. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked a little bit about the application. I think the one thing that there's a lot of agreement on is that going forward, we probably should be backing away from the fall applied uh, nitrogen applications mm -hmm. and looking uh, more at uh, perhaps some in-season applications. Um, seeding rates, wow, we've got some great information there mm -hmm. based on the research you've been doing, going back, what, really eight or nine years, I think, is that right? Well, not quite that long in the population, but at least five or six probably. Okay. Yeah. So you've got a, a number of uh, studies that you've done over the years that suggest that optimum planting uh, rate might be a little bit lower than a lot of people mm -hmm. been using recently. Mm -hmm. Opportunity, Michael, you came up with some numbers about what that might mean uh, on a per acre basis or per thousand, I think you said, uh, quote the number again. The, each thousand, uh, thousand increment in corn seed is 375 to four dollars. Per, per acre. acre, yeah. So clearly, yeah, that's yeah, clearly an opportunity mm -hmm. to make some changes there. And then you also mentioned, Bob, about talking about looking carefully at the traits that mm -hmm. you're buying mm -hmm. and asking yourself the question, do I need all the traits I've been buying in recent years? And there might be an opportunity to make a big savings there, right. so a significant right. savings there. We didn't really mention it, but I think it goes along with that. If you're cutting back on some of those traits, uh, it probably puts a little more pressure on your crop scouting program. Oh, you bet. And that's why it has to be done wisely and not just, you know, willy-nilly. And you've got to be maybe willing to get into crop scouting again. You might be, have to be willing to actually apply insecticide if you need to and or insecticide through the planter if you need to. So it's not something to be taken lightly, but the opportunity is there to save some money if, if you can do it without incurring a lot of risk. Yeah, it's, it's stated another way. You've got to have a strategy, mm -hmm. right? If you're going right. to back away from, from some of those preventative applications by, right. by way of the seed trait technologies, you've got to have a backup strategy right. and be willing to implement it, right? That's correct, yes. Um, and I think that's, that's a challenge for some of us. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, I think I'm going to wrap it up. I, I'm going to mention again, I didn't see any emails coming in with questions during the course of the webinar. But if you have a question, feel free to email it to me uh, later on. Uh, and if it's a question to, that applies directly to, to some of the things that either Jim or Bob brought up, I'll, I'll gladly forward that to them and they'll respond when they have an opportunity. So with that, thanks for joining us in this webinar. We do have a couple of other webinars coming up in the near future, and I'll mention those. We're going to have a webinar uh, with myself, uh, Dr. Langemeyer, and Dr. Mike Bolge uh, on, I think, the 12th of February. And that's going to be a kind of a strategic risk management uh, things that we're going to focus on in terms of how you can improve your risk management here in, in 2016 and looking at maybe a little longer term than just 2016. And then on the, I think it's the 1st of March, uh, we'll have a, a webinar focused on crop insurance decisions, and that'll probably fe feature myself and Dr. Langemeyer. And, and of course, uh, that window of opportunity for making uh, changes in your crop insurance program is really those first couple of weeks of March. So that webinar will be on the 1st of March. So uh, tap into those when you have an opportunity, and we'll look forward to visiting with you at future webinars. Thanks again for joining us.